Our society is changing. We are now entering times where we will soon see a digital society and an economy full form zero, as I will argue. And uh, the, this poses challenges for our society. We need to prepare ourselves, and complexity science is the key for this. I would like to say that we can do that ourselves. Here are some old problems. Problems hitting the earth, hurricanes, volcano outbreaks, earthquakes, tsunamis. But there are some new ones of global scale, such as financial, economic, debt crisis, social and political instabilities, environmental change, and climate change, but also organized crime or cyber crime now spreading explosively, or
who messed up the entire system, the entire world, just think of the family that we for example. What impact it has on the entire world? Now, this is an experiment illustrating actually chain reactions that we have in the nuclear reactors. And we know these chain reactions are a principle controllable. But they're hard to control, and sometimes they get out of hand, as we've seen in Chernobyl, for example. Unfortunately, these experiments are not just funny illustrations of what's going on in the world. There are real examples of this, such as bank pages that we've seen of the bankruptcy of human values. So over time, hundreds of banks have actually failed in the aftermath of this, caused by these mistakes. And hundreds of billions of dollars were actually lost. And finally, we have complex interdependencies between different networks, networks of networks, and they're even more vulnerable in many cases. And that creates a situation where basically every system in the world is now connected and according to the World Economic Forum, the biggest risks now are of social and economic nature. So we need to prepare better for a resilient society. And that's also important in order to prepare for the digital society to come. Because in about 15 years, or maybe even before, we'll have computers that reach brain power. And you can easily imagine what that means. A lot of the jobs that humans are doing today will be done by computers. And probably better and cheaper. So that will put a lot of pressure actually on our labor markets. It will transform our economy and it will also transform our society. We know that uh, computers have been better than the best chess players in the world. We know that they're beating players in TV quiz shows, such as IBM's Watson. So something is going on that will really change the world. And so we need to look into this, which shows basically the percentage of people working in different sectors of the economy. And we all started basically in an agricultural society. Most people were working in agriculture. And then eventually the steam engine was invented. Industrial society came up. Uh, the number of jobs in the agricultural sector is now down to 3 to 5% in many industrialized countries. So almost nothing left. But uh, jobs in the industry sector increased, fortunately. And as uh, the service society emerged with uh, public schooling and broad education of the people, even more jobs were created. So this was filling the gaps. But we know that the transition was really difficult. It came basically this economic and social and political disruption of all kinds. So we don't want this to happen when our society changes from a service society to a digital society. So now a new sector is coming up. The information and knowledge and we can see, if we take this into account, this is red circle there. Then the service sector is already saturated. And people predict that the number of jobs in the service and industrial sector will be divided by two, which means that the first three sectors, agriculture, industry, and service, will amount to less than 50%. All the other jobs will have to be created in the digital economy. And that's the challenge. So the question is, can we master this challenge, actually, with the big data that are now becoming available? So in fact, the data allows for evidence-based decision-making and improvement of all kinds. But I will argue it's not the ultimate solution. And this is because of those curves over here. So the blue curve shows the increase in positive power. 
Every 18 months, do we have a doubling of the best solar power? Exponentially. Data volume increases even faster. Doubles every year, which means that every two years, you're producing the same amount of data as in the entire history of humankind. So, sooner or later, uh, we're getting from the situation where we didn't have enough data to make good decisions into a situation where we have a lot of data, so we can take freedom space decisions, but actually, as we see, there's more data than we can actually process. I mean, something like dark data that we'll never touch, and that means that it's a little bit like a spotlight that sees certain things and oversees other things. So there is a danger that we focus on some things and forget about others. And I think it's happening already. Then there is the third curve. Systemic complexity is increasing even much faster. And we'll see that basically all the data in the world and all the processing power that we can ever have will not be sufficient to keep up the threat. And that is fundamental means that top-down optimization of our systems in the world is not possible in real time. So we would lose top-down control. And as you can see that in many instances as well. So what do we have to do? Is there a solution to this problem? Well, in fact, as the level of complexity goes up, the level of autonomy and control has to grow up as well to achieve our goals. And let me illustrate that with an example from the disaster response initiative. So classically, we have more or less military hierarchical organizations. The nation is collected on the bottom and takes time until it goes up to the person in charge, and then it has to be evaluated in the process and decisions taken, and then these decisions are actually given to those people who are executed and then down to other people and so on. So there is a strict amount of chain and it takes a lot of time. Actually, in many cases, this time delay creates a lot of problems. I just organized a hackathon on earthquake resilience in San Francisco. And it was really astonishing what people came up with. So and it turns out there's a new model of disaster response management that is emerging, enabled by information and communication technology. Now, basically, we need a government based on the information they collect to say, we need this much of water, we need that much of food, we need this much gas, and these materials and so on. And then people and companies would respond to this. I have that much to offer. I can that much, uh, contribute that much. I can do that. And so we need to have basically information platforms matching supply and demand. And this is now becoming possible, but it's also changing this hierarchy to something that combines top down and bottom up in new ways. And actually, we can see a trend towards decentralized bottom up approaches everywhere because it's more efficient. Our immune system, for example, is a wonderful case where actually we are protected very efficiently over a hundred years almost in a decentralized way. And there is a reason for this. In traffic control, we are also seeing that modern approaches to improve traffic flow are based on decentralized approaches, like car to car. We see that peer-to-peer -peer money is going to make Bitcoin has at times been more valuable than gold. We see peer-to-peer -peer lending, and we see that Uber is challenging classical taxis. Also in robotics, we're moving towards intelligent problems to intelligent sports. So, what's the next step? I am seeing that the dream to create self-regulating systems which is about 300 years old. Starting, actually, this is the table of bees. <coughs> I think in this dream, that has also been formulated by Adam Smith in terms of the invisible hand, and which has inspired by so many examples from nature, where coordination and self-organization works perfectly. 
this being from the real life, that so far the invisible thing doesn't work. Unfortunately. At least sometimes. So we have these kinds of examples that you can environmental pollution. Neither more personal politics could fix it in many cases. And overfishing, climate change, to mention just a few examples. And in your situation, it would be beneficial to be cooperative. If you demand a little more and contribute a little less, then basically you're better off and that destabilizes cooperation. And cooperation erodes and gives rise to a fresh group of comments. Compare this with the breakdown of fluid traffic flow, giving rise to a phantom traffic jam. Same kind of phenomenon with this desirable state of the system in the United States. So, can we fix these problems? And I think it's really 300 years later, I can find complex designs and real time feedback enabled by the Internet of Things. We can create self regulating systems and make the invisible hand work. Yeah, in fact, in a few years we'll have about 150 billion sensors connected with. But how to create this Internet of Things? I think we should actually create it as a citizen web. We should build it ourselves. It will not be expensive. The advantage is that you will be in control of this citizen web, of the data that are being produced. And we can trust the system. So it's not really in another surveillance nightmare. This is important, I think. And then this kind of infrastructure can be used to overcome certain kinds of problems by real-time measurement that enable real-time feedbacks to improve the situation, such as this annoying traffic jams. You see on the simulation of a new station of certain road traffic here. That's a situation that we're facing with suffering every day. And third one, which I call bottom-up self-regulation, where the same thing is done, but we also look to the next intersection. If the traffic jam grows large, larger than a certain amount, we'll 
clear it's a don't give it priority to make sure that it's not going to create a spillover effect. So let's see what happens. The red dashed line corresponds to the top-down regulation. You see a few main increases to its capacity utilization. And it's not. And how does that compare actually with the selfish message? Uh, Self-organization based on the local organization and from economic approach. So you can see that for small capacity utilization, we do much better. So the invisible hand works. There is a coordination that happens by itself, and it's more flexible than the top-down approach. However, at the bounds for capacity utilization of 4.6, you can see a sudden human explodes, and the invisible hand principle fails. Very similar to the financial markets, you know, you're pushing it too far, and then the invisible hand didn't work anymore. Can we fix that? Yes, in fact, the other kind of organization that also takes care of the neighbors, the impact on the neighbors, this is the much bigger over the entire range of the capacity utilization. So, surprisingly, if you have a complex organization problem, an empty heart problem, or a computational time explodes the system size, bottom up self regulation can outsmart optimal top down control. And you can see. Exactly what we wanted to have. So we can harness complexity by decentralization. And it's good for everyone. Public transfer action will be much better than private transfer. Motorized traffic also has a benefit. Pedestrian cyclists as well. And the environment also. So why would we do this? In effect, it's now being implemented in place in Germany. Self-organization, self-organization are approaches to can master the complexity of today's systems and benefit from it. So we have to go from this kind of situation of over-regulation, where you're trying to tell everyone and every company what to do exactly at what time, and we are sure that this approach will often fail towards this kind of situation, infrastructure and institutions to support people <coughs> And here is a good example from Egypt. And you can see that here people almost never have to stop. And even though there is an enormous diversity of participants, you know, it just works almost perfectly by itself. There's no policing, no traffic drive. And the reason is the design of this. Because what we have over here is basically a situation where there's a unidirectional traffic flow here, and then in the back there's also a unidirectional traffic flow, and in between is a buffer that allows everyone to adjust the speed in the way that you arrive just at the moment when there's a gap for you. So, suitable interaction mechanism can also be found to enable the self regulation of the economy and society. This is a good thing for it. It's not restricted to technology. And actually, Eleanor Armstrong, the Nobel Prize winner, has shown it. She's done empirical studies of self governance that confirm efficiency given that proper design principles are applied. So, what do we need to do? Well, if you analyze the kind of situation that we might be involved in with an interaction partner or with the environment, then there are four kinds of possible situations. A lose lose situation where the interaction is bad for both sides. We should avoid that. A win win situation where it's favorable for both sides. We should do this. And maybe you can make sure that you know, both are benefit in, in a similar way. So, fairness. Nice. And uh, there can be bad in situ situations where one would win, the other one would lose, but altogether it would deteriorate the situation. Now, the one who wins 
once the interaction has happened, so there is a, a danger of exploitation of the other person. But altogether, it's very difficult for that situation. And then, good win situation, win lose situation are those where one wins and the other loses, but altogether, it would be good. So, if you would arrange a value transfer, this would become good for both sides. The question is, can we build technologies in order to support us in these four kinds of situations? And I think that we can build social mirrors that would increase our awareness in a certain situation in context. We could create social adapters uh, that basically help to understand the expectations and visions of the other side, and in particular, people have different cultural backgrounds, different interests is important, so it helps us to find a good deal. Social protection would help us avoid lots of interactions, and social money would uh, help us actually to create a beneficial value transfer. I can't go into detail, but there is a patent on this, and just to give a few more ideas. So, awareness is really important, and in order to create it, we could map change in the world and who causes it. We could have a kind of Wikipedia for this. Uh, we could map resources in the world and who uses them. We could map social capital. Solidarity and other things. <coughs> and they can all be used to protect it and to increase it. We could create maps of tensions in the world and how they come about. And we could match, uh, we could map culture and how it spreads. In fact, now we have invented a way of writing up our language, the alphabet. And that was really crucial for our culture to evolve. Unfortunately, we don't map our culture in detail in a formalized way. The social norms, the habits, and what they're good for. We can't almost uh, explain them to the foreigner. So we could barely be aware of all these things, although they're really critical for the functioning of our society. Suppose we would be able to formalize that, like an alphabet, would help us so much to understand each other and to create beneficial interactions. And that's the goal of the intercultural or social adapter effect. And the simple instantiation would be a real-time translation that Skype is now offering. We can also uh, build more instruments to explore and improve the world. In the future, I see we have a number of proposals. So, one could build a planetary nervous system, uh, interactive virtual worlds, and participatory platforms. And I was also in favor of reputation systems. So, we could put four. Um, the planetary nervous system would actually enable real time feedback. The interactive virtual rules would be important to identify the rule sets that would create the desirable kind of self-organization that we'd like to have. Because that's crucial to have the right kinds of interaction rules. And then we'll participate with the platform to allow crowdsourcing, co-creation, and so on. And uh, reputation mechanisms would help us uh, to improve the quality, basically. Now, the transfer nervous system has started to be built. Um, we have a living archive, which is a search engine for open data. And we're also working on using our smartphones in order to create the transfer nervous system by opening up the sensors with the user consent and connecting them with each other in order to allow for collective measurements in an anonymous way. And in fact, uh, we are doing this and we welcome to join in because it's an open project such as OpenStreetMap. 
Besides creating a mirror of roles, we can establish interactive virtual roles for new social economic mechanisms. Mm -hmm. And um, we could actually implement them in uh, kind of parallel virtual roles. And it, these virtual roles could actually implement different kinds of financial systems or different kinds of positionable or intellectual property values. Follows 
and saying, we need a majority to build the network, to master the global 21st century challenges, and build the framework for the emerging digital society. So let's do that together. Progressing the computing power, the uh, big data volume, and so on. You have also the one on complexity. Right. And it's very clear the units of computing power, very clear the units of uh, 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 hard disk uh, uh, ability, and so on. But what are the units of your complexity? You had something like 350 units in recent times. What units are these? So, um, what happens is that uh, if you network system, you get combinatorial opportunities. So you take two objects. If you connect them, you form a third one. Then you can connect the, the, the first with the third one, the second with the third one. So you get ever more possibilities. And we know that's a combinatorial function. Now, of course, we don't realize all these options. Maybe we realize maybe thousands or maybe millions of these options. But altogether, it's a combinatorial and uh, that goes much faster than an exponential. And I actually think that we already see that, that we have often this loss of control. You know, think of the financial crisis, uh, think of the wars on Iraq and Afghanistan, and uh, think of uh, climate change. No, we have lost control, let's face it. And so we should take the bite of this paradigm 